Hello and welcome to Commodity Culture, where we break down the commodity space for both new and experienced investors. Before we dive in, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investing advice. Do your own due diligence. And today's guest draws on his 20 plus years of experience in the energy industry to help investors in the sector maximize financial returns while lowering air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. Mr. Brian Gitt, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Excited for our conversation. I am excited as well, and I want to get started like I do with all new guests with the origin story. How did you discover investing and what ultimately led you to the energy space? Well, what led me to investing is losing a lot of money on a startup, <laughs> ironically. Um, no, I, I actually worked, as you mentioned, in the energy industry a long time and consulting, and then I, I started a software startup that was focused within the energy space, um, and I was... 100% a believer in our mission and what we were doing and the, the business opportunity. And we ended up failing and we ended up losing a lot of money, both my own money and, and investor money. And that experience, that failure forced me to really reflect on how I could be so wrong. Um, and what beliefs did I hold that led me to make these decisions? So that experience sent me down the, the rabbit hole and doing a deep dive on studying the science of decision making and judgment, and actually, there's quite a lot of lit there's a lot of literature out there. There's decades of literature that have studied this topic, and I realized how ignorant I was not only about making good decisions, specifically related to investment, um, but also how ignorant I was about the energy system itself, even though I had worked in it for 20-something years. And through that experience, uh, that painful experience of going through and kind of uncovering some of these unquestioned beliefs and really digging down to bedrock to understand where I went wrong, uh, I realized there is a huge opportunity um, to invest in the energy space because there's so many people that were confused or ignorant like I was uh, and that believe a lot of these energy myths and that are putting their money behind the, the wrong technologies and the wrong companies. And so through that painful experience, uh, I found my way to investing in energy. So I want to dig a little bit deeper into that experience you had um, where you were seeking, as you described it on your website, like a utopian form of energy. And as the great Thomas Sowell has stated, there are no solutions, there are only trade-offs. And um, that's how I view the energy industry. I think that's how you view it now. I think a lot of the world has this persistent belief that we can have our cake and eat it too and live in, as you said, an, a utopian ideal. Um, but can you talk about the journey that led you to eventually wake up and take a more practical approach to energy? Sure. I mean, my journey really in energy started when I was a teenager, and I fell in love with the outdoors. I used to lead all these outdoor adventure trips in Alaska and throughout the Southwest or teenagers, and those experiences led me to really want to understand environmental issues and resource conservation and pollution and these various factors that contributed to harming the places that I cared about so much as when I spent time in the wilderness. And so I, I did I started studying all of these various topics and going deep into that. And I can remember sitting in a classroom at this in a northern Arizona in Prescott, Arizona, and listening to Amory Lovins speak. Amory Lovins is a thought leader in the environmental movement and energy efficiency and renewables for many years. And I remember him saying things like, more energy hits the earth in one hour than humans consume uh, the entire year. And these kinds of ideas um, are romantic ideas, and they attracted me. I was, I was sucked into this um, belief system, and you know, I, I just went all in on it and <laughs> was basically working in that space in one way or another on energy efficiency and renewables. And um, because of a lot of these core assumptions and beliefs that's really started as a teenager in my early 20s, when I was, I would say, pretty impressionable, like many of us are at that at that time in our lives and we're we're grasping for something to grab onto um, that gives us a foundation of values to to help us navigate life and decisions so it was through those experiences that set me on this course and unfortunately i didn't check myself and question my beliefs soon enough and so they just kept piling up more of these beliefs built on layer and layer and layer almost like sedimentary rock that just continues to grow over the years and uh, so that's kind of how I got into that and in, in some of those belief systems. 
So part of your focus is exposing false beliefs about renewable energy and the problems with the ESG narrative, um, which I love to hear. Could you break down some of the more persistent myths that come up and that you're trying to expel when it comes to renewable energy? Sure. I mean, I think one of the more pernicious myths is that in solar and wind power is cheaper than other traditional energy sources. I mean, this is absolutely false if you take a full cost accounting view. Um, when you think about wind and solar power, they're in essence expensive, wasteful add-ons to the existing energy grid. Because of their intermittency, I mean, the, obviously the sun's not shining all the time, the wind's not blowing all the time. And when you look at a grid like Texas or California where they're having significant issues with blackouts and not being able to hit um, generate enough energy during peak demand, what you're seeing is you, in essence, you need a redundant grid. Um, you, you basically, for every megawatt of solar and wind that you have on the grid, you really need a megawatt of usually natural gas or some type of traditional energy source. Uh, because what happens when those go to zero, which we saw in Texas, you know, during the height of the energy emergency this summer in Texas, when everyone was cranking their air conditioners and there was so much demand for electricity, um, wind power was like less than 3% of installed capacity. Right. So how in the world are you supposed to run civilization when you have fickle energy sources that whether they decide to show up to work or not, you can't you can't run civilization like that. So that Texas example is a perfect um, reason why we cannot count on these resources. And if you can't count on them, then that means you have to have that redundancy. And that means you have all of the investment in that natural gas plant, in the pipelines, and basically maintaining that whole system. And in addition to that, because of a lot of the voltage issues, they, basically wind and solar power are injecting chaos into the system, right? Because they're going up and down. As clouds come over, you get a solar slam, basically uh, wind droughts. So you're introducing this chaotic force into the energy system that's more expensive to manage. Now you have many different decentralized generation assets that are much more complex to manage and balance the grid. The grid has to be balanced 100% of the time, right? You can't you can't have a deficiency. So, it's that's one core reason why wind and solar are not cheaper. Thinking that they're cheaper just because it, at a particular hour during the day when the sun's out, that the cost of energy is cheaper is is crazy. You're only looking at a teeny part of the equation and ignoring all of the other costs that are real costs. And this is why in every place in the world where there's a high penetration of renewable energy or there's a mandate. So the, across the United States, there's a number of states that have what's called renewable portfolio standards, meaning there's some kind of mandate to get to 20% or 30% uh, or more um, renewable power. Um, you see increased utility cost to consumers because even if the wholesale cost is lower for a few hours during the day, ultimately the all these additional costs are getting passed on th to the consumer. Utilities aren't charities. They're not going to just eat all of these additional costs. Um, and I think the, the best example of this is Germany because there is no country on face of planet Earth that has invested more in renewables. Um, over the last 20 years, they call it their energy transition plan. It's called the Innervende. And they have spent about close to a half a trillion euros um, over this these two decades. And they still had to maintain 90% of their fossil fuel generation fleet. Their utility costs have doubled during this time. And now you're seeing the deindustrialization of Germany because none of these businesses can afford, if you're a ceramics factory, glass factory, and, and uh, aluminum smelter, steel smelter, these are energy intensive industries that can't afford to operate. So they're either rationing or shutting down and considering moving out of Europe. So for all those reasons, energy costs are higher with solar and wind power. This is the Uranium Element Cube from Engineered Labs. They're a sponsor of the program now. And the reason why is because I genuinely love this product. I've always wanted to get real uranium in my hands, and that's what this is. That crystal in there is 50% uranium by weight. The acrylic shield surrounding it reduces the radiation emitted to a very low level that is completely safe. Uh, Engineered Labs also ships worldwide, which is great. The products are made in the USA, and if you use my discount code COMMODITIES at checkout, 
you'll receive a 10% discount on your order and you will be supporting this program. The Uranium Element Cube, link is in the description below. And now, back to the program. That's a great point. Um, I want to switch over to fossil fuels um, because a lot of headlines we're seeing these days are saying fossil fuels are going away, they're going to be phased out. That's what this whole new green economy seems to be about for a lot of the uh, political class and environmental groups that are pushing it. Um, I had Doomberg on the show recently and he said that their team believes there's really no such thing as peak oil. He thinks in 100 years from now, humanity is going to be using more fossil fuels than we're using today. I've heard other people say, oh, 2040s, 2050s will be peak oil. Um, where do you think humanity will be with their use of fossil fuels moving forward? And is peak oil somewhat of a misnomer or will we ever reach maximum um, oil on this planet? I think we're going to continue our march up the ladder of energy density to basically utilizing more uh, energy intensive forms such as uranium in nuclear power. Uh, we're going to continue to use natural gas um, to as cleaner burning fuels. In essence, we're going to continue to burn cleaner fuels over time. And, but that doesn't mean that we're going to be replacing or getting rid of um, existing fossil fuels overnight. I mean, the reality is that Fossil fuels are going to be with us. I would tend to agree with Doomberg's comment there uh, for a very long time, at least for our foreseeable lifetimes. I mean, 97% of the entire transportation on the planet is still f fueled by fossil fuels. 97%. So how is that going to zero in the next decade? Um, the, the IEA, International Energy Agency, loves to put up these projections about peak oil. They just came out with their 2002 report. And this really shows you when you get possessed by ideology, the same way I was possessed by ideology, it really warps your thinking and filters how you see the world. And I can't imagine a scenario. I mean, let's just look at the facts. The facts are the world in 2050 is going to consume 50% more energy than today. And most of that is going to come from the developing world, parts of Asia, India, those, those countries, right? And those countries are not rushing to get rid of fossil fuels. It's quite the opposite. They're ramping up their usage. You know, when you look at India and China, they're talking about saying they're going to phase out uh, by 2070. It's like 50 years from now. Um, and that's just a ridiculous um, comment anyway, because there's, no, there's no accountability for any of these politicians in 2070 uh, that they're going to phase out of fossil fuels. But all the trends say that we're going to be using a lot more fossil fuels. However, I think there will be a trend towards embracing technologies that reduce pollution, that reduce emissions. We're going to continue our march to using cleaner burning fuels, such as nuclear power and natural gas, but we're not getting rid of fossil fuels. I mean, Chris Wright, uh, the CEO of Liberty, um, Oil, Liberty Energy now, it used to be Oil Field Services, he, he, he has a quote that says, you know, in a million years from now, 90% of the fossil fuels will still be in the ground on Earth. So we're not going to run out of them. Um, we have an immense amount of fossil fuels. Now, it's all about how much does it cost and to extract those and to convert them into usable energy. But we, we don't have any shortage of, of potential fossil fuels to um, extract. So your investment thesis, and you touched on it a little bit just now, is that nuclear and natural gas will be the biggest winners in the energy sector over the next 20 years. Can you break that thesis down in a little bit more detail for us? Sure. I think there's really three converging trends that lead me to that hypothesis. Um, the first, which I just mentioned, that the world's going to consume a lot more energy, 50% more energy by 2050, and most of that's in the developing world. When you look at the developing world today, if you, if you cut out China, the use of renewable energy is flat. Since 2015, there's zero growth in wind and solar power in the developing world outside of China. Now, China has been investing a lot in renewables, but they're even investing more in coal. <laughs> so um, I think we got to keep all this in perspective. So that because we're going to need all of this energy and these developing countries are going to be reliant on fossil fuels and they are going to be marching towards nuclear power, right? And so they're going to looking for cleaner burning options. Um, and natural gas is really the cleanest burning fossil fuel. Um, so that makes sense that there's going to be 
kind of a, a preference or the various uh, climate related legislation and policy. So this, that's the first thing is, is the demand. The second thing is what I was just alluding to, which is policy. Um, whether you're in agreement or not, the world has embraced um, CO2 reduction emissions policy um, across the board, whether you're talking about government, corporate entities, investors, etc., that is impacting the market. So no matter whether you believe it or not, it is going to have a huge impact. And I don't see that momentum just flipping on a dime and turning anytime soon. So you're going to have these restrictive policies that are going to limit the amount of energy that can be um, extracted and, and leveraged. And so I think as these emission targets get more and more tense, that we're going to be forced to move towards cleaner burning options. And nuclear and natural gas are the cleanest burning options. Uh, natural gas uses 50, has 50% 50 of the CO2 emissions is coal and 10% of the air pollutants. So it's an incredibly clean burning fuel. And nuclear power has zero emissions. Um, whatsoever, and it has a teeny footprint. Um, so for those reasons, I think that these policy trends are going to guide us to clean and burning fuels. And the third area is the market incentives. So we're at the beginning of a cycle. I mean, it doesn't take a, a genius or a rocket scientist to zoom out and see that we're underinvested right now in supply. I mean, we... Unfortunately, the, the, the U.S. oil and gas industry lit $300 billion on fire uh, over a 10 to 15 year period during the shale boom, which is an incredible innovation in, in technology and contribution to the world. But investors lost big. They lost tons of money in it. And they are shy about going in and barging in to invest that money again because they, they lost so much during it. And then when you compound that with these policy trends and talking about stranded assets for oil and gas, uh, that is very concerning for investors. And so you can understand the hesitancy um, of not just wanting to plow forward and starting to pump tons of new investment into oil and gas. So because of that, because we have this structural supply shortage, because we have these policy trends that are going to continue to restrict it, um, and because we're going to need a lot more energy. Uh, and so all of these converging are the reasons why I believe that nuclear and natural gas are going to be the biggest winners over the next, let's say, 10 to 20 years. I think natural gas will be the biggest winner in the 2020s um, because of speed to market. We already have the infrastructure and it's, it's basically already being embraced. Um, nuclear takes more time because of the regulatory uh, headaches involved. And we're seeing a huge turn right now on the global stage with a resurgence in interest in nuclear power. Governments that were against it, whether we're talking about uh, and going in the other direction from Japan to Korea to the UK to even France was starting to, to um, divest from nuclear. All of them are doing about face and reinvesting uh, in the future of nuclear power. So th for all of those reasons, I'm very bullish on those two energy sources. So when it comes to nuclear and the push we're seeing now, we're seeing a lot of policymakers reversing course. We're even seeing environmental groups kind of turn around and take a closer look at nuclear and start to to preach for it, uh, for, for lack of a better word. Um, so that looks very bullish for uranium over the long term. Would you agree with that sentiment? And also, I wanted to ask you this because I've gotten several questions from subscribers regarding thorium-based nuclear reactors. I think those are still a far ways away from being um, adopted. But what, what are your thoughts on the potential for, for thorium-based reactors possibly becoming the norm at some point in the future? Well, like all of these topics, they're very nuanced and you need to drill into each one and take them one by one. So when you talk about uranium, um, I'm generally bullish on uranium. However, when you're talking about that, um, you have to consider that advanced reactors or the small modular reactors are going to be recycling a lot of the existing spent fuel. So it won't require new mining for that. You know, so for example, I work, I'm head of business development for a small modular reactor company called Oklo. And our technology, as well as TerraPower, Bill Gates' company, X Energy, all of these um, new advanced reactors are going to be leveraging recycled spent fuel. Um, so they're not going to be requiring lots of new mining because 
we have like what 85,000 tons of spent fuel sitting in, in various sites around the United States um, that's a problem. They don't know what to do with it. And these new reactor designs recycle that because over 90% of the energy is still embodied in that spent fuel. And it becomes the input or the fuel for these small, for these small modular reactors, uh, for advanced at least. So <clears throat> that's one thing to keep in consideration. Just, just if all of a sudden we start building hundreds of these advanced reactors, it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be mining a ton of new uranium. Right now, I am bullish on uranium because I think we, in addition to SMRs, we're going to need large centralized facilities. It's not an either or. I equate this to airplanes and cars. So it, it's not like you're just going to transport yourself around in an airplane. You're going to need cars, right, and vice versa. So I, I use both. I just was flying for a data center conference to the UK. I'm not going to drive there, right? So these products have different purposes. SMRs, advanced reactors, are serving different market niches than the large centralized light water reactor um, projects. So I am bullish on uranium. I think we're seeing these, some of these large projects and United Arab Emirates and Bangladesh um, and Korea, Japan's turning on all their nukes again. So there's a lot of positive trends that would bode well for uranium, but we got to be nuanced in it because you have all these advanced reactors that aren't going to require a ton of new mining. They're going to be recycling spent fuel. So that's the first part of your question. The second part was about thorium. Um, there's various approaches to fuel type. Uh, I'm not against thorium. I think it has huge promise. Uh, the reality, though, on the ground is that the regulators have not approved thorium um, as an alternative fuel, at least in the U.S. And so we have enough problems that it is getting through the regulatory process today, um, much less trying out a brand new fuel that hasn't really been tested in commercial operations, right? I mean, Oklo, my, my, the company I'm working for, we've been formally engaged with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission since 2016. And we're only now in the final stages of getting our combined license approval. If we were introducing a new fuel type on top of, I mean, we're already using what's called HALU fuel, which is um, high assay, low enriched uranium. Basically, it's 19.5 to 75% uh, enriched. If we we're going to um, also start to go into a totally new fuel type, that's going to add a huge regulatory burden and, and slow down the, the timeline for technology adoption. So I'm not, I'm not against thorium. I think it show, has huge promise, and we probably will use it in the future. But I don't see it as being a realistic, viable, near-term solution, at least in the United States uh, and in most of developed countries uh, in, the, in the kind of near future. So where does coal stand in your eyes? Because we have a lot of European countries now. You spoke about Germany. They're one of the main main ones who, due to their own misguided policies and this whole push for renewables, are now ending up burning dirty coal, which is kind of insane to consider. And as a species, it seems we're burning a ton of coal at, at the moment, and that trend could continue moving forward. So do you think coal will ever be phased out, and should it be phased out? Or is there a possibility of using cleaner burning coal um, and having it be part of an overall energy mix? Coal currently provides a really important role in, in the energy system, specifically in the developing world, because ultimately, if you're going to cut coal, it's a choice between coal or poverty, right? They, they don't have the, the resources necessarily in all of these developed countries to build out the necessary infrastructure to support, let's say, a nuclear fleet or uh, a whole natural gas fleet overnight. And so when you really look at the choices that a country like India has, which 75% of their of their energy is coming from coal, their whole economy is structured around coal, their train system, all the transport, all of that, all the people that are employed um, producing coal from mining to processing to in the various coal plants, you can't just flip a switch and shut coal off. Right, because ultimately you'd be dooming people to poverty, um, and no one wants that. So if you care about human flourishing, you can't just cut coal overnight. Now, I think we should be transitioning to cleaner burning fuels, specifically in the developed world, where we have the money to do it. And a great U.S. is the best example of this. The U.S. over the last 15 years, since 20, 2005, has cut about a billion metric tons of CO2, more than 
all of Europe combined, by the way, um, in by switching from coal to natural gas, because as I alluded to earlier, it uses 50% of the CO2 and 10% of the air pollutants. So we can transition away from it, but you have to have the, the wealth and the resources and the infrastructure to do it. And as you're seeing across the world right now, when it comes down to it, coal is what we need to rely on to keep the lights on to keep people from freezing to death in their homes or to keep the economy going in many countries so i that's why we're seeing a resurgence in it because if a politician is going to have to choose between um dooming his people to poverty or turning on a coal plant or increasing coal production they're going to increase coal production right energy is the foundation of civilization it's it's of our healthcare system of our sanitation system of our food system all of these things are reliant on energy so we can't just flip these things off overnight um i think we we'll, we will continue to put emission controls to burn uh have less emissions from these plants and eventually to transition to cleaner burning fuels so when it comes to investing in the energy space, could you give us a little bit of a glimpse into your approach? Are there any energy producing commodities that you're particularly bullish on right now? And are, are there any that you're avoiding at the moment? I take a portfolio approach and I try to look at the upstream, midstream and downstream. And so my portfolio includes uh, upstream producers like Liberty, um, EOG, you know, whether it's on the oil field service side or the actual uh, upstream production side. I look at midstream, you know, everyone from enterprise product partners and energy transfer, uh, they have very different characteristics to their business model because the, f the cost of oil or gas, um, they're, they're more sheltered from kind of huge volatility because their contracts oftentimes will float with that, um, with that variability. So that kind of gives a little bit of balance. And then I'm very bullish on, on the downstream, on companies like Chenier and uh, these others in LNG, because LNG, as we're seeing right now, is basically keeping Europe alive right now. And we have a huge structural shortage um, internationally. That's why the spot market has gone crazy and, and people are paying exorbitant prices for it. And unfortunately, due to bad European energy policy, because they restricted domestic natural gas production, they shut down nuclear plants, they overinvested in renewables, um, they're now forced to import LNG from other countries, namely the US uh, and Qatar and, and other places. And so uh, there's a huge competition for that resource because Asia traditionally has been the biggest consumer of LNG. And now there's, uh, you, you basically have Europe trying to uh, eat up as much as it can. And the people that get hurt the most are countries that now can't even access energy. You know, whether you're talking about Bangladesh or Pakistan, these countries are having huge shortages because Europe is basically buying up all the LNG on the market uh, and, and sucking all of that resource away. So, you know, we're going to see, um, I think, a lot of chaos in the system for some time to come. And you can't just build these things overnight, right? I mean, new LNG import terminals in Europe take two, three years to build. You can't just all of a sudden, even if we have the LNG, they can't accept it because you got to uh, regasify it and be able to transport it and, you know, have the, the ship stock. So there's there's a lot of complexity to uh, this. But in general, I would say I, you know, I take a longer term view. I'm not a trader. Uh, I'm not looking to get in and out of the market over the next six months or even year. I, I generally take like a five year, three to five year time horizon when I look at my own investment portfolio in the energy space, and I try to diversify it across those different categories, upstream, midstream, downstream. Um, so those are some of the things or some of the principles that I look at um, when I'm constructing my own portfolio. Do you invest in the uranium space as well, or do you stick mostly to oil and gas? I do, but it's mostly in index. It's indexed, like Sprott, um, you know, Uranium Trust, and kind of those types of opportunities. I don't have specific individual investments beyond my, my own uh, day job, which obviously is a huge investment um, in the, the nuclear space because that's where I spend all my time. So I'm very bullish on, on nuclear power and uranium. And that's actually, I would say, is my biggest investment because our, our most precious resources are time. Uh, and that's what I'm doing every day uh, in terms of my professional career. So uh, I'm, I'm very bullish on the space, but I don't have a lot of 
individual investments outside the company that I'm working at and kind of indexed to uranium in general. So this push for a new green economy, it's gotten pretty insane in my view. And the worrying part is you have these citizens of these countries who have not done really a single hour of proper research into the matter following equally out of touch politicians. So we're in a scenario of the blind leading the blind. It's actually kind of terrifying when you when you really look at it. Um, will this madness come to an end at some point? Is it going to take a lot of pain for people to wake up and realize like, hey, I don't want to die in the winter. I want to be able to, he I, I, I want access to, to the, the lifestyle I've enjoyed up to this point that was made possible largely by fossil fuels and other things that they're now protesting against. Will there be a pendulum swing at some point? Yes, absolutely. I mean, this cannot go on. This is madness. I mean, we're speeding towards a cliff and, pu you know, pushing on the accelerator as hard as we can. Uh, and it will course correct because, we, you know, at the end of the day, people, we all really want the same thing. Um, we, we want a better life for our, our family and our and our kids. Um, we want quality kind of health care and education and all of these things will become impossible if we don't have reliable, affordable energy, right? I mean, it, it is the foundation of everything, right? It, whether we're talking about um, our businesses, like what's happening in Germany, where you're, you know, I think it's 35 million people are employed in various energy intensive industries in Europe, right? And it's, it's about 50. 15% of the overall workforce is tied to these energy intensive industries. So what's going to happen when all these companies either have massive layoffs or shutting down or moving overseas because of these bad policies, you're going to see huge social unrest, right? You're going to see people voting out those politicians. So absolutely this will course correct. I mean, I don't, because we all want the, the same thing and we're seeing tremendous chaos already. There's 101 countries that have social unrest due to energy and food shortages in the world right now, 101 countries. That's a significant amount of unrest. And this is only going to get worse um, because we haven't yet identified that we're going down the wrong path. Uh, we still keep doubling down on this redu ri ridiculous renewable energy fantasy, and we're still continuing to even debate whether we're shutting down existing nuclear power plants, right? And, w and we're talking right now in the news today about windfall profit taxes on oil and gas companies, which is a huge disincentive for them to invest in new exploration and production. So for, for all of these reasons, we haven't even come close to making the course correction that is necessary to put us on the right track, but we will hit the wall and different countries will hit the wall at different time periods. Hopefully the world will learn from other mistakes like Germany. And when we see one of the most competent, wealthy countries in the world, deindustrialize and people freezing to death in their homes uh, in the winter time and people out of work and their whole quality of life degrading, maybe we can learn from that. I hope we can. I hope we all don't have to suffer um, the same fate but it, I, I'm not overly optimistic. <laughs> I mean, usually these kinds of things, you have to hit the wall in the, in the have huge consequences to kind of course correct. So that's the unfortunate reality we find ourselves in. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Brian. It was an excellent conversation. For those who are watching right now who want to hear more from you, where's the best place they should uh, go online? They can follow me on Twitter at Brian Gitt, just my first and last name. And then I write long form articles uh, that I usually always put up on my website, BrianGitt.com, just my first and last name dot com. And I also write for, you know, uh, various journals and stuff here and there. So but those would be the two best places to, to follow my work. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.